I'd now like to introduce a staff member of NGLTF, Karen Bullock-Jordan, who's with a field organizer and has been in touch with many of you over the phones as part of the key connectivity between the task force and your work. And I hope you'll have a real chance to spend time with Karen, with Tracy, with Scott Nakagawa, and others from our field staff to make sure that your work and our work are as closely linked as possible. She'll be introducing <laughs> our uh, plenary speaker this morning, Karen Bullock-Jordan. I know that we're running a little behind on time, so I'd like to ask uh, for an indulgence from you as I say a small thank you to a woman who's here today, a woman whose sense of passion and justice has been instrumental in instilling the kind of commitment that keeps me doing this work in the face of so many obstacles. For being here, not only this weekend, but every day, I'd like to thank my mom, Kate Stiggers. There are many reasons to respect and cherish today's plenary speaker. There is his commitment to the constant struggle to dismantle heterosexism and homo-hatred in the black church. There is his documentation of the spiritual warfare being perpetrated by the radical right and strategizing on how queers of color can be instrumental in combating it. There is his willingness to be all of who he is even when it works the nerves of those who consider themselves to be our leaders. <laughs> Not only in the gay community, but in the black community. One of my personal reasons for the love I have for this man is what he gives to queers of color who are searching for a connection to the spiritual traditions of our ancestors, traditions that have been almost eradicated by the white man's need to destroy and subdue. Elias's theory of ritual goes beyond mere rhetoric and to the practical reality of day-to-day -day living, creating ceremonies that mark important passages in our life, including the one he created when he married my partner and me two years ago. The next voice you hear after mine will be the preacher of the hour, the very fierce Dr. Elias Barajaje Jones. Buenos dias, bonjour, and good morning. I want to dedicate my remarks today to Andre Fallon, a dear friend of mine who was a grassroots freedom fighter against homo hatred and erotophobia, who died of HIV related complications last November, but who always made it a point to attend creating change wherever it was being held. Also to Miss Tyra, a trans person, a genderqueer in DC who was left to die by a transphobic fire department. And to Essex Hemphill, writer and black gay sex radical, and to Nat Turner, slave rebellion leader on the day of his execution. And those who were here last year but are not here, those who are in the closet or afraid to be here, those who didn't have the means to be here, or whatever, in solidarity with the strikers, and with a little old white man in Baltimore who told me, it's true, we do have to stand in solidarity. The police are taking over in the United States. <laughs> to the living and to the dead, we bear witness. We are here. Many think that we are not supposed to be here, that we are not even supposed to exist. But we are here. And we serve notice on the world today that we are here, that our numbers are growing every day, and that we are not going anywhere 
that we do not want to go. And we are here because others prepared the way for us. I salute the four directions of the universe and ask my native sisters and brothers, the people indigenous to this area, to give us their blessing and permission to be here on their soil, on their land, to be near their waters. I salute all of our ancestors, our native two-spirit ancestors, the first people of this land, those who were visionaries, healers, tellers of the tale, keepers of the rhythm, who were massacred and driven from their sacred lands. We salute all those two-spirit, queer, transgendered, lesbian, bisexual, gay, questioning, I switched the order, <laughs> people of all colors who have died here and elsewhere, down throughout the ages, because of inadequate health care, male supremacy, hatred of women, poverty, violence, transgender phobia, crimes of homo-hatred, the prison system, but also in the struggle with HIV AIDS, with breast cancer, ovarian cancer, cervical cancer, those who were targets of white supremacy, police brutality, the power of the closet that sought to make them unknown, invisible, and unheard, and all other evils that silence and drain life away. Ours is a remembrance rooted in a spirit of solidarity and a spirit of resistance a resistance that strengthens us and empowers us to live, to act boldly, and without fear to demand justice and liberation for all. So we ask these ancestors to bring their spirit of resistance and strength for us to fight for the liberation of our blessed Mother Earth, the liberation of all oppressed and silenced and invisibilized peoples and creatures. May they walk with us and bring us new strength for the struggle, May they tenderly wipe the tears from our eyes. May they guide us to see that as two-spirit, queer, transgender, genderqueer, lesbian, bisexual, gay, questioning people of all colors who demand a world of justice and equality, our walk is together. May they remind us that we are the tribes of the moon, the people of the rainbow, a sacred people. I call now upon the Orisha, those multicolored, multi, multi, multi gendered manifestations of the divine in the Yoruba religion of Nigeria, Cuba, Brazil, Puerto Rico, Haiti, the United States, the religion known as Santeria or Candomblé. I call Elegba, opener of the way, the trickster, the guardian of the crossroads, messenger between worlds, the place where many of us as queers stand. I call Obatala. Shihi Orisha, source of wholeness, justice, balance, creativity, and clear thinking. I call Oshun, mother of femmes, source of pansensuality, expression of sensuousness, beauty, and sex. I call Ogun, father of butches, he who teaches us to fight injustice. I call Olokun, multi gendered ruler of the depths of the sea. I call Inle, multi-gendered healer, mother of dykes and butch queens, keeper of healing plants, to whose worship a society of dykes in 19th century Cuba was dedicated. I call Osanin, keeper of the knowledge of the medicinal properties of plants, powerful healer. I call Yewa, keeper of the dead, mother of lesbians, bisexual women, and transgendered women. I call Yemaya, Orisha of the sea and maternal compassion, mother of gay men, bisexual men, and transgendered men, and of all persons living with HIV. I call Shango, keeper of lightning and thunder, that great icon of machismo, but who is also known as Santa Barbara. <laughs> I call Baba Luaye, the Orisha associated with HIV. May he help us to find cures for AIDS. I call Chochipili, Tonantzin, Kuatlike, and Chochiquetzal, Expressions of the divine indigenous to the Americas connected to traditions of homoeroticism. I call Oya, my mother, the tornado and whirlwind, gatekeeper of the cemetery, beautiful bearded warrior, power of radical change and transformation, the fury of the tempest, the sweeping winds of change, revolution, 
the destruction of the old society making way for a new mother of all queers, she who accompanies us as we go to the world of the ancestors. For Pat Robertson and those of his ilk who have a hard time thinking of the spiritual and the erotic in the same sentence, <laughs> they can go get a clue. <laughs> Thanks to my sisters, absent and present, past, present, and to come, my sisters who helped me to find and use my voice. Thanks to the people of color communities who give me my strength. Thanks to the NGLTF staff for hard, 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 hard work. <laughs> Thanks to the bisexual and transgendered communities especially to Lorraine Hutchins and Lani Kahumanu, editrixes of By Any Other Name. <laughs> thanks to Leslie Feinberg. And thanks to Ernest Dillon, who I don't think is here, but who's a black gay man who broke silence here in Detroit. <laughs> but most importantly, thanks to all of you. May I say a few words? It is with these words that Sojourner Truth, in 1851, began her great Ain't I a Woman speech, in which, long before there was any discussion about essentialism or constructionism or gender studies or queer theory or even NGLTF for creating change, <laughs> she makes it very clear to all of us that there was definitely nothing immutable or essential, as we would say today, about gender any more than there was anything immutable or fixed in stone about race, class, sexuality, or the right to self-definition and self-determination. Sojourner Truth, that great escaped slave, abolitionist, womanist, traveling orator, preacher, gender outlaw, and overall paradigm subverter, <laughs> points to the intersections of race and class in the construction of gender. Sojourner is my shiro, because instead of trying to adapt herself to the societally accepted definition of woman of her time, she challenged both the definition and the standards that had created it. Her speech, but more importantly her life, exposed the concepts of woman and man as being socially constructed and therefore like notions of race, class, sexuality or self-determination subject to change according to social, political, geographical, historical, ideological, economic factors and circumstances. Sojourner Truth deconstructed with her words and with her body. What I want to do today is offer us new ways of looking at being what I call Queers in intersection. Queers in intersection where we admit that there is no longer any such thing as being just queer. Where we move beyond either or thinking. Where being queer means also being a Filipina, dyke-identified single mom with HIV who risks losing custody of her child for a whole host of reasons. And ain't she a queer? Where being queer means acknowledging the particular issues of queer women of color in their struggle against multiple oppressions, and ain't they queer? Where queer means acknowledging that it is impossible to understand these issues without a class analysis of the socio-political <laughs> economic factors contributing to sexism, and sexism understood as systemic oppression, not just people not being nice. <laughs> as, <laughs> as compounded by white supremacy, which is not just bad redneck white people. <laughs> and ain't we all queers? Yeah, we are. Without sexism and gender oppression, heterosexism could hardly exist. Queers in intersection where being queer means acknowledging that race, class, gender, sexuality, spirituality 
are not monolithic distinct categories where we as queers can see an understanding of race that must include an understanding of elements of class, gender, sexualities, geography that go into shaping notions of race. How race, gender, sexuality, geography go into shaping notions of class. How race, class, and sexuality are factors and facets of shaping gender how the war against women and their bodies from the burning times until the beginning of the dismantling of abortion rights is connected to the masculinization of healing, to the hardening of Christian religious dogma, the driving out of the goddess, the abuse of the earth, to the expulsion of the other, of Muslims and Jews from Spain is connected to the slave trade and the invasions of the Americas where Africans and indigenous peoples were massacred because they were considered to be like women, incarnations of evil, unbridled lust, too connected to the body and sex, and where the earth was destroyed because like women, it was wild, like dark-skinned people, it needed to be dominated and controlled. Queers in intersection. <laughs> Queers in intersection where we as queers understand how race, class, gender shape our experience of our sexualities, where queer will no longer mean to straight people or to queer people of color or to straight people of color or to us, just queer white men, but where we can hold many images in creative tension at once, where we move finally and lead the movement beyond binary either or thinking, where we understand the fluidity of desire and the fluidity of gender, where we offer a way of transcending binary thinking and look at and delight in complexities, where we understand that if what we said earlier about how notions and gender roles have been and are shaped by a multiplicity of factors, then there must be more than two genders and male does not equal superior, where freedom is also freedom about gender identities, because if we're not free there, are we really free? That if we still labor under someone else's notions of gender, we are prisoners under a system of gender apartheid. Queer and intersection, where we understand that spiritualities are about the art of wholeness, the politics of wholeness, the aesthetics of wholeness, where spirituality and the erotic constantly inform each other, where erotic spirituality and spiritual eroticisms are sex positive, are body affirming, where there is nothing wrong, but indeed it is something whole and beautiful to be a pagan leather man, where these spiritualities shape our moral discourse, inform our values of respect, our values of mutuality and liberation and intentionality, where we can say, but we have our own traditional family values that come out of our tradition, yeah. our notions, <laughs> our notions of family, where the family can be two queers or more, where we will fight for domestic partnership, for coupled marriages or for marriages, recognition, recognition of all sorts of relational configurations, just because we want to make sure that we all have the same rights and so that no one gets thrown out of an ICU. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Spiritualities that are not just anti the discourse of the religious right, but are our own thing our own voice, and ain't we queers? Queers in intersection where we understand that adding bisexual or transgendered or questioning to names of our groups is not just a matter of putting the word there, but knowing that that inclusion reflects a different way of seeing things, a way that challenges the ways of seeing sexuality in the dominating cultures. Yes. And, <laughs> And while we add them, while we add them, we're not throwing out whatever is before. We're not throwing out lesbian and gay when we add 
bi. We're not throwing out lesbian, gay, bi when we add transgendered, and we're not pitching the whole thing when we add questioning. But we're also looking at how some of our traditional cultures understand sexualities in other ways, and we can hold that in creative tension if we are queers in intersection. Either or thinking sustains our oppression and keeps us from seeing commonalities of oppression. If we add these names, it's a way for us to say that boundaries are blurred, that erotophobia, the fear of the power and uses of the erotic, which eroticizes and exoticizes those who are perceived as other, people of color, women, poor people, queers, etc., and sets us up to be dominated, controlled, and kept in neat categories. Queers in intersection where we understand that we live in a world of fluid constructions of sexualities, desire, and gender, that there are many people who have sex with all genders in varying and dazzling relational configurations. <laughs> but that this should shape how we see the many faces and many facets of HIV prevention and education, and that when we talk about HIV in prisons, we are not only talking about, but we are talking about transgendered, lesbian, gay, bisexual, questioning people in prison, and people who are queer not just situationally, they went into prison queer and will come out of prison queer. <laughs> Queers an intersection where we understand that disability does not mean incomplete, that the tendency to equate disability and tragedy keeps us from struggling together for justice for people living with disabilities. Disability makes us confront issues of access and accessibility, which are issues for all of us in many different contexts and many different ways. Disability makes us address its social aspects such as poverty and class, isolation, alienation, social erasure, marginalization, invisibilization. And it makes us understand that bodies are not just flesh and bones bodies, but that they are also bones and braces bodies, bones and wheelchair bodies, and that the refusal to address the concerns of people living with disabilities is to reinforce oppressive notions of the perfect body, read, a white, able-bodied, heterosexual male body. It is to, this perpetuates marginalization and discrimination. Queers in intersection where we understand that all of us are impacted by issues of age, where we are all younger and older than someone else but that queer youth issues are all of the above that we have mentioned, that 30% of youth suicides are believed to be related to sexual orientation, the high rate of suicide among queer teens exists because many of our youth feel that death is the only option for them and we offer no alternatives. People would rather think it has something to do with being queer than it has to do with the fact that society tells us that we should not exist. Senior queer issues are also a combination of all the above issues. When we understand that understanding the ways in which we understand, then we have to act in different and new ways. So a multi-issue movement is logical because we are a multi-issue community. <laughs> There is no monolithic queer identity. Politics of complexity or politics of complex identities. That means, for example, that our HIV work in all of its aspects has to, must, take into consideration all of the above aspects and more. There's no generic HIV. We're all tired of the same arguments. We're all tired of having to talk about race, class, gender, sexuality constantly. But if we move to queers and intersection understanding, we don't have to have those arguments anymore. <laughs> Just 
like we don't need to say, well, we invited people of color, but they don't come back. <laughs> because we will understand the systemic nature of racism and exclusion, and we will be involved in our own anti-racism, anti-oppression work, and people of color won't have to give all the drama anymore because <laughs> white people will call white people on their shit and men will call men on their shit. In terms of strategy, we can use direct action, which has not gone out of fashion. We change political fashion the way we change drag, you know? It's like, <laughs> oh, we're giving Queer Nation for these two years, and we can be on the street doing civil disobedience. No, we're not going to give that anymore. Um, <laughs> but we can use direct action and legislative work. We can use civil disobedience and lobbying and publishing and media where we meet and challenge an organization's life we have to call to accountability organizations in our community and where we must ask, for example, GLAD to let us know yeah. why two outstanding people of color activists, <laughs> Donald Suggs and Cathay Che, were fired, especially as their work helped shape this new vision of queers in intersection, not just around race, but around class, around gender, and around sexualities, especially around bisexuality and transgender issues. I want us to shape our own discourse. I don't want to respond to the right anymore. I want to shape the conversation. I don't want to let erotophobia, I don't want to let erotophobia shape us. I want us to show it up for what it is as queers in intersection, that it's rooted in hatred of the body, and since this society fears and hates women, it depicts them as temptress, as body, as the incarnation of the libido, sex, the dirty, whatever. So you can't separate erotophobia from the fear and hatred of women. That erotophobia and racism intersect in the investment of people of colors as the exotic and erotic other that erotophobia keeps shame around rape to silence women who are believed to just be asking for it. Erotophobia in class make the government say that poor people are to stay controlled because they are too erotic. Anti-Jewish propaganda, anti-Muslim propaganda, anti-pagan propaganda rooted in erotophobia spreads images of Jews, Muslims, and those who practice traditional earth-based religions as too sexual. And of course, all leather SM people are psychopaths, if you believe Hollywood and TV. But just as desire is to be policed and controlled, and women's bodies are to be controlled for profit by men, and people of color controlled by heterosexual white men, who are by definition pure and virtuous, <laughs> so is the environment. When we talk about the virgin forest, the savage jungle, to be controlled. And erotophobia keeps us from talking about safer sex in terms that are unmistakably clear, keeps us from distributing dental dams and condoms, leads them to exclusively advocate abstinence, yet at the same time, the marketing industry uses sex to sell everything from underwear to whiskey. But erotophobia has begun to make us censor each other about being too sexual about our forms of sexuality as being too transgressive. Some queers find bisexuals an embarrassment because we seem to be too sexual. Yeah. Thank you. Erotophobia marginalizes the transgender communities and the leather SM communities because they too stand in the way of assimilating to the great white heterosexual host. And so we produce all of the patterns of the dominating culture. We don't fight to keep our sex clubs open which are often the only place where some people can have access to information. We run away embarrassed. The problem is erotophobia, not being sex positive. If the religious right focuses on transgendered people and leather people in their films, then we're quick to say by saying, well, those people 
should not be visible in our public manifestations because they ruin our reputation. We can't even discuss the fact that children have sexualities without being afraid of being accused of being pedophiles or pro-pedophiles. So that is something else for us to condemn and it won't stop there. We censor our own art, the very expression of our souls, of our visions, of our healing of the world, and it won't stop there. Ultimately, we will end up condemning ourselves. Hasn't that already started to happen? Isn't that what we actually are already doing? We buy into the erotophobia of the religious right and say that so many parts of our community are just too blatantly and negatively sexual. So we're all racing to capitulate to erotophobia instead of challenging it. And in that moment, we have let ourselves be defined by homo-hating erotophobes. Where is our self-esteem? Where is our self-definition? I speak out of a sense of urgency. We have victories, and I applaud them. But crimes of homo-hatred are on the rise, many of which in people of color communities go unreported because even greater violence might come from the police or the Immigration and Naturalization Service, the Migra, or because of being closeted in fear of reprisals, of losing jobs or child custody. Many areas of the country see an increase in murders of transgendered people without any reaction or public outrage from the queer community. I've been detained by the police for hours, not knowing if it was because of my hair, the way I dressed, because of the queer stickers on my car, but they were looking for concealed weapons and drugs and I was in a Tibetan Buddhist monastery. <laughs> I have received hate mail and death threats. I have been denounced on the floor of Congress by the honorable or dishonorable Bob Dornan. denounced in black newspapers and elsewhere simply because I dare to speak openly about sex to question and challenge gender oppression. And for that, I spent weeks this summer afraid to go outside, afraid to open mail, afraid to sit near windows, afraid to start my car. And this is because of what I do, not just in the queer of color community, but for all of us, of all genders, races, colors, and definitions of queerness. And ain't I a queer? When I was 13, I asked a German Jewish aunt of mine who was a Holocaust survivor why Jews and others had not fled Germany or organized massive resistance to Hitler as he rose to power. She answered, we never believed it would go that far. Our good German neighbors would not let something like that happen. But they did, and millions died. But my aunt taught me that lesson as well as the lesson of her pro-Palestinian work, because she said, never again means never again for anybody. <laughs> so, so when I came out politically in Switzerland, in the Front Homosexuel d'Action Révolutionnaire, the Homosexual Front for Revolutionary Action, my first thought was that no matter what legislation there was to protect us queers, it could be revoked. I still believe that we must work to dismantle gender oppression to offer new ways of understanding gender, sexualities, relationships, and how we understand human rights. We see initiatives passed and we see them revoked. We see AIDS funding cut, especially as we witness the feminization, the coloring, and the pouring of HIV. The government tries now to make abortion illegal. And I can't think, help but think of what happened to Berlin merely 50, 60 years ago. We should not be faced with the dilemma of turning straight or disappearing. Because we won't disappear, nor will we let ourselves be disappeared. And the same people that say turn straight or disappear are the people who say don't speak Creole, don't speak Spanish, don't speak Chinese, don't speak Hmong, don't speak Arabic or Navajo, speak English or disappear. If we own our oppression and name it, then and only then can we speak from a place of strength, of self-determination, of self-definition. Then we shape 
the conversation. I look at the border here, and I am surprised to not see it crawling with the migra. I don't see border patrol boats everywhere. Because there's no fear of brown people from Canada invading US territory. But, but there is that fear of those dark-skinned people along the southern border, or people from Haiti. Then tell me that immigration policies do not reflect white supremacist government policies. We're proud of being Native American, Middle Eastern, Pacific Islander, Asian, Latina, Latino, Jewish, multiracial, Sinti Roma or Gypsy, black, as we are of being queer. The two are inseparable for us, and we cannot and will not let them be pulled apart without doing irreparable violence to our very souls. And we challenge our people of color communities to dismantle monolithic notions of race that equivocate queerness with selling out to white people. We will no longer be invisible in the white queer world or in the straight people of color world. And you will help us as we help you. And we too will be challenged by poor and working class whites. And we will strive to work in coalition, not to be cute, but because as queer is an intersection, that is our way. Sojourner Truth was both mystic and activist. Sojourner Truth was the very incarnation of both and thinking. Sojourner Truth, as icon, led a life in the spirit and a life in activism, and a life where we would hear her say, ain't I a woman? Ain't I a Jew? Ain't I a Palestinian? Ain't I a lesbian? Ain't I a Bosnian? Ain't I a deaf person? Ain't I a Puerto Rican freedom fighter? Ain't I a Pacific Islander living with AIDS? Ain't I a homeless person? And ain't I a Muslim? And ain't I a Haitian? And ain't I a genderqueer? And ain't I an Appalachian? And ain't I a woman living with breast cancer? And ain't I an immigrant? And ain't I a pagan leather man? And ain't I a sex worker? And ain't I a queer teenager? And ain't I a Hopi? And ain't I a woman? And she would be there at every march with us she would be there doing civil disobedience, getting arrested. She would be there challenging us constantly to be bolder freedom fighters. And she would be there being happy and not pressed about what anyone thought about her. And she would, and she would tell us men that women's HIV issues women's issues of breast cancer, cervical cancer, ovarian, ovarian cancer, reproductive rights are our issues because they are issues about the sovereignty of the body. She would tell us that never again means that we stand with all those people who have been alienated and marginalized, all those who have been oppressed, all those who have been exterminated on the basis of perceived otherness, that the struggle against white supremacy is the struggle against classism, is the struggle against sexism, is the struggle against homophobia, is the struggle against ableism. If we are all to be restored to full humanity and exclusively heterocentric, heterosexist, heteropatriarchal social order must be dismantled, we cannot liberate one group at the expense of another. And to suggest that men of color are dehumanized solely as a result of not being able to enjoy patriarchal privilege instead of calling for the dismantling, you know who I'm talking about. Instead of calling for the dismantling of patriarchy implies that the subjugation of women is essential to, the men, to men of color's development of a positive self-concept an idea that only serves to support and reinforce a heterosexist social order. But we must learn to work together to dismantle the oppression that suffocates all of us. And when it is all over, when it is all over, when it is all over, 
I hope that we can say in the words of Sojourner Truth, I ain't gonna die, honey. I'm going home like a shooting star. I say. <laughs>